Hello, listeners. This is Jim, the Keys bartender. How are you today? It is a beautiful day here. Let me pause this music. Yeah, once again, it's as if I've never podcasted before. How are you today? I'm doing great. Got, I think I got everything done. The wife comes home normally and she asks, what did you do today? And I have to get, I guess I have to have some things done. She did know I drove the daughter to school and then I worked out for an hour and a half. And then I wrote for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Well, you could tell probably, you'll be able to tell by the quality of the podcast, I guess, listener, dear listener, um, and, uh, you know, to see that I've been active. So the thing I wanted to talk about today is I know this isn't unique to Key Largo or the Florida Keys or Florida or beach communities and things like that. But think of any tourist de- destination where alcohol is prevalent. I'm not talking about the Vatican or the Louvre. Maybe the Louvre, you know, you never know. People have a may have a party in there. But I'm talking about resort towns and things like that. But... In, in the restaurant, I noticed, and this goes for l- tourists and locals like a, a cruise ship mentality when it comes to traveling with your drinks. Now, I'm going to state right away in the beginning, you know, I'm a, a sober alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic, whatever you want to call me, but an alcoholic in recovery. I don't drink now, but I have been that I that guy that rode around in a car with an open container. Yes, 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 yes. I've done all that. I haven't really, I haven't done the hard liquor thing. I don't know why. It was a Rubicon I wasn't prepared to cross because bourbon is, ooh, you know what I mean? You smell that. You know, have a cup of a flask of bourbon on you when you're driving. That's kind of like a 19, that's prohibition era kind of things. Where you got the flask in your pocket and you're driving down the road all shit faced and stuff like that. And I've driven that way too. But I'm talking about the open container, not only in the car, but walking into a restaurant. Walk into a restaurant with a liquor license. I'm not saying walking into like a fire hall or the Knights of Columbus or anything like that or during a block party. I'm talking about driving down the road, having your drink with you and then coming into a restaurant with a drink. Open container. Now, I'm not saying it's better or worse than, well, actually it's probably worse drinking and driving, but I'm just saying the optics, it is a no-no, at least in Florida and a lot of other states, if you have a liquor license for you to have an open container come in with you, you know, your own cocktail. I think you could probably come in with your, like if you were shopping and you stopped and you had a bottle of bourbon or, or whatever, and you just put it down next to you and didn't open it, didn't drink it, having a closed bottle that you had and you're giving it to someone or you're going to take it home or whatever. But once you open that, with the exception of being wine, because there's corkage fees, because there's an explanation for it, people, places that don't have robust or varied wine list, like the place I work, People like to bring their own wine, have their favorite wines, if there's not a huge selection. People are always, you know what I mean? That's the way it is. Now, I worked at some places that had tons of it. I would, the place I worked at, the Encore, we had 60 different types of wine, 70 different types of wine. There's, I know there's places that have over 100, maybe 200, some crazy amount. And in those places, you can obviously, you can bring your own bottle and you get charged anywhere from 15, I think it's now it's $15 on up to 25. And uh, that's to, you know, that's just 
because the place is paying for a liquor license. You're not paying for the liquor or the wine there. So you're bringing your own. You're denying them. It's almost like a, it's not theft of service, it's denial of payment. I don't want to get into that legal part because there's probably some people with a better legal background than me to argue that. But the idea that you're going to walk around with a drink, and I'm not castigating people for that. I just don't understand that mentality walking around. I've done it when I first came down to Key West. Walked out on the street where you're not supposed to be drinking in public areas in the state. The law clearly prohibits that, but they do a wink and a nod at certain places. Well, one place is where people can go from where they're sleeping to, to a restaurant with a drink in their hand is on a cruise ship. Or, let's say, at an all-inclusive resort. But let's stick with the cruise ship. Yeah, there's booze everywhere on a cruise ship. Any, there's almost any place you could go on a cruise ship with liquor. Maybe not the um, main cabin. Maybe not the main cabin. Who knows? You know, where they, where the, you know, where the captain is and all that stuff. But that's the mentality. And people just don't even think, they don't think t- two thoughts of it to come in. But the problem with it is that it's so prevalent now down here that it's really hard to say, hey, listen, You can't bring that in. And what is going to happen eventually, and it happens in cycles, eventually it's going to happen. Either they change the laws and it's it's legal, which is unlikely because liquor laws have just gotten more restrictive if you think about just your blood alcohol content on up to all, all sorts of things of where you can drink. So... They're actually, alcohol has gotten more restrictive. So they're going to clamp down eventually. And they're going to say, listen, there's all sorts of things you can't do once you have a liquor license. You can't gamble. So we are in the midst of a playoff season. So a bar can't, like a bartender behind a bar says, this is mine. I'm doing a block pool. We're not doing a block pool. That's gambling. A block pool. You know what a block pool is for my foreign listeners? American style football, what they do is they set out a grid of 10 rows and 10 columns on a sheet and you write your name on each one. You pay anywhere on up to, I guess there's probably thousand dollar block pools and there's a hundred squares, right? So whatever the amount is, they if there's a party going on, sometimes they take a portion of the the block pool and then pay for the party. But generally they split it up into four, uh, there's four quarters in American football. And whatever the last number of the score is, at the end of each quarter, you go to the grid and whoever's name in there, they win that. They win that square and that's, it could be divvied up all sorts of ways, but just let's say it's one quarter of the total amount. So it's a hundred dollar if it's $100 a square, 100 squares is $10,000, so it's $2,500. That's what you win. So if at the end of the first quarter, it's 10-10, and the last number on each is 0-0. Zero, zero. So you go to 0-0, zero, zero, and they arbitrarily choose the numbers for each column. So if you think you're going to be cute and you go right up to the upper left-hand column and think, well, that's 0-0, zero, zero. that's going to be a good one to have. No, nah-uh. That, there's no guarantee that, that what they'll do is have some random uh, number generator. It could be cards, and they come out and say the first number, two, second number, seven, eight, and, and they'll put it in those slots. So you put your name in first, and then they fill out the numbers once the uh, whole uh, block pool is filled out. That's what it's called, a block pool. Well, that's gambling. Okay, so horse racing, if there's a horse race and then you, you allow 
people to, you know, you take bets on it, that's illegal too. Any type of thing. Now they do it. Ever almost, I defy anybody to go into a sports bar and not be able to find a block pool. Uh, that, that's a wink and a nod thing. What I was talking about, it's like they know it's going on, but they kind of like, yeah, no gambling. That's gambling. Now, if they really wanted to get you, they could get you on that. What they're trying to do is get a hold of bookies and things like that. People that spend, you know, they, they place two, three, four thousand dollar bets on the side and the bookies come in and they collect. I had about five years ago, five to six years ago, a guy came in. And when I was bartending, he says, there were a lot of people bet here. And I go, well, well that's a crazy question. Of course they of course, they talk about, you know, laying personal bets and stuff. I bet you $10, I bet you $20, and blah, 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 like that. He goes, well, listen, if you ever get, he goes like this, you ever get any bets or any action, I will cover it. I will cover any action you need. And he's trying to, and he also dropped off baseballs for us. And he says that anybody comes in, uh, a, an athlete, or celebrities and stuff like that, you can get them to sign the baseballs. And I'm like, I, for one, don't recall, I don't follow baseball, so unless it's Derek Jeter or, or what, some other Cal Ripken, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, or the guy, uh, the Big Hurt, he's in the Viagra commercials. He's always talking about taking uh, new... Nugenics. Nugenics. I take Nugenics. But Frank Thomas. I I recognize him. But I haven't recognized any baseball players. And the first thing I do when they come in here, I'm not going to say, hey, I got this baseball here. Can you sign it? How creepy is that? So what I did is I had everyone at the bar sign it. Sign it with their names. Even the women. And people say, why... Why is that a big... I'm just saying it's a baseball. So the guy ever came by, he collected, goes, what are these women signing these baseball? These aren't players, you know. So we just had signatures on the baseball. And so I, I imagine those baseballs are gone now. So I imagine um, someone probably saw it real quick and they took it. And that would be amazing if they went to a sports memorabilia thing, thinking, how much can I get for this? Are there any signatures on there? And the person would say, I don't recognize any signatures. And they say, well, they're just local people. Well, let's get back to it. Yeah, there's tourists and and uh, locals, and they walk around with their liquor, and they come right in. And like with the, the light gambling, coming in with one drink may not be a big deal may not be a big deal. But if anybody ever decides, like some liquor authority decides, we got to put the kibosh down on this stuff, and they decide to make you an example, because they make examples of people all the time when it comes to liquor law enforcement. And they do it with, uh, Christ, all sorts of things. They can't, I guess it's really hard for them to do a... uh, What's that thing they do when they go when they try to uh, set up a sting, a sting operation? What they do is they bring in an underage and try to get served. They will hire as a contractor, I guess, as a contractor, someone at underage, and they'll send them in to try to get served, and they'll see directly that the person is not carding at all. You know, a girl comes in and just. I say, may I see your card and look at it? And they, and they can give you a bad card. They can give you a card. They can give you their card. But what they can't do is give you a dummy card. Or if you ask them, if it's a sting, are you twenty one? Or you know, twenty one or older, they can't lie because they lie that directly fails a sting. So they could. When whenever they want to put a guy, they they make an example of you and they make it stick what is they they enforce it so if they do a sting with the underage drinking they find the bar they take they arrest the bartender take them in the bartender gets charged 
Yeah, that's just a one out of thing. And it's one, like, so if someone comes in, you don't recognize them, blah, blah, blah. They look like they're under 30. I go, give me your card. Can I, may I see your cards? And then I go and explain to them. This is what I say to them. I say, hey, they're very strict. I don't know who you are. Um, I don't want to be the example here. Okay. Or you can just say, are you 21? But then again, if, if they're going to say, um, once you give you the card, you, you can ask that first because you can find out if it's a sting. When there's a sting around, I always ask people, are they 21? And they'll write down and say, Didn't t- they aren't 21. And then look at their card. Because then if they have a fake card and, and lie and all that stuff, I say, listen, I asked them if they were 21. I carded them. And they, if they lie about it, that would shit can their sting operation and if it's not one of those and it's someone else they go and catch the person uh being underage drinking then i'm covered that's my due diligence so we don't want to be the one that makes example the time they decide to do that and it's very expensive for the the restaurant because that's a big violation of your liquor license it is a big violation it's just like if you take I don't know if you know this, but if people, I don't know if any bars do this anymore. It's more like an old West thing, but you take call liquor or very premium liquor and you put cheap liquor inside it. I can't imagine anybody doing that because that's a huge, huge fine or watering down your liquor. They used to, you always see that in the old West is like they put some whiskey in there and then you put a little water in there to stretch it out to make you know make a little more money because there's nobody really enforces there's no i think uh in, in the old time saloons out west they probably didn't what what do you mean a liquor license you don't have a liquor license just serve we just serve whiskey and beer and you can water it down there was no authority now there's authority so but if you're caught doing any of those things they could shut you down like boom 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 but the big problem is, like I pointed all that, these things out, I'm talking about it ad nauseum, is if you become the one, the only place in town that enforces that, then you're the asshole. Yeah, you're the asshole because you're the one that is deciding that, you know what, I'm going to be proactive, this is getting really bad, I better start saying this. And then the owner might say, hey, listen, let them go. And well, you know what? If I don't get in trouble, if the if the bartender doesn't get in trouble for letting someone in, then and if whoever is managing or the authority and, and, and you know the owner, if they don't have a problem with, then I could probably lean back, you know, sit back on that. I may just mention it and say, hey, listen, this is becoming more prevalent, and we are right across from the government building. So what do you think? I guess I shouldn't be saying that because I'm getting tilt my hand. But part of the reason is, I think, is we're, Key Largo is, I wouldn't say unincorporated, but we're not, we're not a municipality. We're not a municipality. We're wholly, wholly governed by commissioners as part of the county. And there's only a couple towns. I think there's Layton, Key West, Marathon. Uh, Almorada. I don't even know if Tavernier is a township or anything like that. But it's just really amazing when you don't have the auspice of being a township. When I was a kid, my family had a camp um, campground, had a cabin. I think the family, the relatives still have cabin up in this area, north of Doylestown, Pennsylvania, in a small hamlet called Pipersville. And Pipersville wasn't a village and they were small enough they didn't even have they didn't have any police officers they just used the state police you know if any if you, you know there was any problem and stuff they just sent the state police to her and that's where it is i think most of places in the united states it's one of the things townships do themselves now in the keys almost i don't know how it necessarily works but the the county does the policing in Monroe County. 
And I guess that kind of makes sense considering we're one road and you have these arbitrary lines where the road goes down, you know, US one, it comes one, the other, the other town. And that's almost most of the town. It's most of the Keys population until you get down to Key West and Marathon is are all within a quarter mile of that road. And sometimes much less. So, but we do not have, and our next authority is the county here. So you can't, we don't have a mayor saying, hey, listen, this is getting out of hand, this drinking, the way people behave here. This open container thing, driving around with it, stuff like that. We're kind of concerned about it. You know, we want to be, we want to be fun, but we don't want to be one of those funds where it's dangerous. And it bleeds on over to development and things like that. We have one, two, three mattress stores in a tiny town. One, two, three mattress stores. We don't have a large department store here, but we do have three mattress stores. That's crazy, huh? We have uh, a couple cigar shops down here, a couple ice cream, but three mattress store. Yeah, but not one department store. And there's signs all over the place. And it's just unchecked development in town. The county enforces it, but the county, if the county needs housing, new houses that are want to beef up some of the tax rolls and things like that, Put the houses in Key Largo. There's not going to be any pushback from the city because there is no city. There is no city of Key Largo. They have a commissioner and they share the commissioner. The com- commissioners here are elected by everyone. So it's not just like the commissioner that, that's up here is voted on by people only up here. They're voted on by everyone in the county. So... The lead commissioner now is from Marathon. And, but she's in charge of all the commissioners. She's the, the, I don't know if they call him the mayor of the county or something like that. I don't know how you can be a mayor of a county. You could be the county commissioner or the county administrator. I don't quite get that. So when I was looking, I was looking for a picture to get off the subject. I was looking at a, a picture of drunken tourists because, you know, I I thought about putting that in as the cover for the show. And then I, I, I almost said that search engine, but I'm going to say I searched. I searched for it. I almost said Google. But, I mean, that's what most people use as their search engine right now, or Safari, I guess. And... What I saw when I went into pictures is a lot of pictures of drunken British tourists. And I did not know that was a thing. Not at all. I mean, I I don't see, when I run into British tourists and things like that, I don't see them inordinately drunk more than people uh, from the United States or more so than German people or Greek people or Slovenians. I don't know. It's interesting how that there must be drunken British tourist stereotype in Europe. Because I don't see it here. I don't see it here as much. And I'm not trying to curry favor with those guys. I am not. Even though I don't. I'm not trying to curry favor because actually I have more listeners in Russia than I do United Kingdom or or Ireland. And talk about stereotypes. I mean, here in the United States, Irish were stereotyped to being drunken ones, but it was drunken British tourists, not drunken, drunken Irish tourists. So, just for your own, and maybe I'm Maybe I will, maybe I won't get more listeners. Britain, I don't believe they're any more drunken than American tourists or Irish tourists or Australian tourists. Uh, definitely, you know, Indian tourists don't seem to get drunk 
as much. They may have a drink or two. They may be good for a margarita. They won't eat meat. Right? They won't eat meat, but they'll drink a margarita. Which, uh, I guess there's no meat in a margarita. That would be a horrible margarita, wouldn't it? Well, I'd like to thank all my listeners here, but I, I wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about history and the way it unfolds. And rarely do people know at the time when history is occurring or something significant in history is occurring that people realize its significance. Like the Great War, World War I or World War II. When the Great War came around, they just called it the Great War. And they didn't call it World War I until there was a World War II. And originally they didn't think this is World War II. And every time after World War II, people say, like, if the U.S. was going to go at it with Russia, they were going to say that was World War III. Right? Or U.S. and China. Well, currently, if you're not paying attention... There is a lot of going on in Eastern Europe. And and Russia has about a little north of 100,000 troops along the Ukrainian border. And that's a lot of troops nowadays. In the old days, you know, 100,000 troops, that's that's really nothing. You know, when they were, during World War II, they would line up a half a million troops, half a million to a million troops when they invaded a country. Right? But now, because they're so mechanized and so many tanks and armored personnel carriers and helicopters and and attack uh, jets and whatever, right? Artillery. That... They do a lot more damage with these things. So they're lined up. And they're, I, I guess we're seeing it occur in slow motion because it wasn't quick. It's occurring almost as slowly as World War I did. Now, World War I, the Germans started getting... The German, the German Empire and the Austrian-Hungarian Empire were upset over an assassination in Serbia of Archduke Ferdinand. And the Russians were quick to mobilize in support of Serbia. It was another fellow Slavic country, and it wasn't necessarily a treaty, but Russia was supporting, and they were still under, I think it was Tsar Nicholas, if I remember correctly, uh, it took a long time because they didn't have planes and and highways and things like that. They did have railroads, and it took a, months and months to um, build up your troops on the border. Well, it it turned out that it took so long to do that, and the Germans started doing their own thing too. The Germans and the Austrians, Hungarian Empire, they in World War One, nineteen fourteen. Right around that, so it was. They saw everyone saw these troops coming closer and closer. They were building up troops along the border, and he knew it, and he knew it, and he knew it. They knew it. They got like, wow, this is taking a long time. Well, the Russians took so much effort to bring the troops in 1914. They were going to say, we're not going to spend all this expense without doing anything. We got to teach these guys a lesson. The Germans did the same thing. We're not going to do it. So they went to this position right now where it was more of they didn't think it would be that big a deal because these other wars, there were wars that occurred where they avoided cities and things like cities weren't destroyed as much as much. There were cities destroyed in prior wars. But World War I was one of total war where they used chemicals and stuff like that and Cities were destroyed, uh, crops were, I mean, uh, everything. It was, it was devastating. Now, fast forward 100 years, 109 years, let's say, 108 eight years, 100, 108, 109 years. And this, not the same thing because it's along the Ukraine border, 
but you you can see the line. There's a it's a big area. And there's Russian troops all around it. And what is on the other side is a Ukraine that is loosely affiliated with NATO. And NATO is a North Atlantic Treaty Organization set up in 1948 by the U.S., um, by Truman at that time, and George Marshall, who was Secretary of State, who was at one time the head of all the U.S. armies uh, during World War II, they set up this treaty organization to face a powerful... uh, uh, so you had a powerful army. They had just defeated the Germans. They, they had a couple million men under arms. And um, most of the battling went on in Germany and France. The two most powerful countries in Europe prior to World War II were devastated. And they were weak. And they were ripe. If the Russians really wanted to do something without American help, uh, they would have quickly fallen against an aggressive uh, Russian push west. So America set up in West Germany, put in pre-positioned troops, forces, tanks, and stuff like that. More symbolic because for the longest time, the Russians had so many more men, but the Americans had nuclear weapons, m- more nuclear weapons. And then the Russians got, uh, Soviets got nuclear weapons, and they were able to count. Now, the same thing's occurring kind of like right now, but now it's NATO. And uh, NATO's there differently than World War I and uh, different during the Cold War. I mean, NATO's moved further east. So former Warsaw Pact countries of Poland, Estonia, Latvia, Bulgaria, Hungary, I may have missed a couple of them. Okay? Bulgaria, Hungary, blah, 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 Poland. They're all in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. They're, they're all part of NATO. And part of the thing in the treaty, if you attack one, you attack all. Ukraine is not involved in it. They're loosely affiliated. They're not signers on the NATO agreement. So if Ukraine gets attacked, uh, U.S., Britain, and all the member nations of uh, the 20-something members or maybe 30-something members of NATO aren't responsible to respond militarily. But they're allowed to give aid. And that's what they're doing right now. And where the Ukraine is, Ukraine sits right up against Poland, between Poland and Russia. To the north of Ukraine is Belarus, a Russian ally, and they got a dictator. And Belarus sits on the Polish border. And north of all that, and Russia, north of Belarus and all that, is the former Soviet republics of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, and they have NATO troops in there. And there's NATO troops in Poland, and so any ability, anything that happens, let's say planes accidentally go into Polish airspace, the U.S. would be responsible, would be legally responsible to respond in kind, in kind, if its attack was made against Poland. So, that's where we're at right now. And Putin's is in the, he's painting himself into a corner where who's, Putin's the leader of Russia, where things could get hairy. And we're in the midst of these things and people are worried about other things right now. They're worried about other things. They're worried that they can't get their new car. They're worried, uh, and there's, they're, they're uh, bread and butter issues. Healthcare, their pay, education, taxes, infrastructure. When over, I don't know how many thousands of miles, 6,000 miles away, there's something that could happen that would really drastically change their lives. And will. And it's, ha- and it's happening right now. So, and, and the danger is, if, like, if you overcommit, the Russians, if they're posturing, which you wouldn't move all those troops there and posture and stuff like that, you they're thinking. If they're posturing, nothing happens. You don't want to tilt their hands and give them a reason to invade. Also, you don't want to back off protecting a 
loosely affiliated ally because then they'll say, well, they'll just make another power grab for another country. Who's next? Poland? Poland? Maybe not. But then there is Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania that have significant Russian minorities in their countries. Right? So it looks as if Putin's trying to reconstitute the former Soviet Union. And the U.S. and popular opinion may say, well, listen, we don't care. We do not want to lose men and women fighting in these European conflicts and stuff like that. Well, we are legally responsible unless we choose to pull out of NATO. People say, really, you're not like the U.S. military is an all volunteer military. So it's not like they're drafting people. Now, the Russian army is a conscription army. That means a draft. They're a conscription army. They have to, people in Russia, when they come of age, they have to, um, I think it's only men, have to serve in the Russian military. Now, if things were to get kind of bad and uh, there was a sustained insurgency after our invasion of Ukraine, which people feel that Ukraine would lose uh, some major engagements against a conventional army, their insurgency could cost a lot of Russian lives. And that's where people in Russia would come into play and say, listen, we're really, this is crazy. And they start looking at Putin and say, listen, you started this. But this is history acting right now. Now, if it passes and nothing happens, people will not have learned anything. And then into the next time that, let's say, Poland decides that gets in a problem with Belarus. And this past summer, there was a significant problem with Belarus. Belarus is the furthest part the former, of, of the former Soviet republics that pushes against Poland. It was one of the former Soviet republics. And it's also called White Russia. And they they were letting immigrants run towards a Poland border and, and without stopping them. And they were using the immigrants as a way to antagonize Poland and cause problems with, uh, cause internal problems for Polish. That could have turned into a battle. That would have been if Belarus, an ally of Russia, decided that um, they wanted to do something stupid or Poland did something stupid. Um, they incur the wrath of a Belarus, then the U.S. would have had to step in. And we would have missed that. We would have missed that, meaning missed it. We would have missed knowing that, oh, you got to be really careful. And this is always going to happen as long as Putin's in trouble because with a strong man in power, they, they don't use things to build up their popularity. What they do is they do actions. They do actions to stir patriotism and things like that and to get support. They don't do, they don't do uh, big policy decisions like you say, oh, we're going to build up education. We're going to build up our infrastructure. We want to make sure that, you know, every child is healthy. Things like that. They got big problems over there. And when countries have big problems and they have a strong leader, a very I mean, authoritarian leader. War is a definitely an option on the table for them. So watch out. Pay close attention to these things. I know this show, Keys Bartender, isn't. But at my bar uh, where I work, we always talk about foreign policy. At least I do. And sometimes people chime in on that. So I'd like to thank you for sitting in and listening to that whole thing. I didn't school you. And then some of these things I understand you're going you're gonna to read a lot of different things. And Russia has a very robust um, social media presence. And they're going to say a lot of shit about the Ukraine. And the Ukraine is not innocent in everything I understand. But the reason Russia is doing it is Ukraine is weaker. If Russia really wanted to pick on someone its own size, they got a neighbor right in the Far East that they can, they got a, a, several of them. And wh- one of them's China. The other's Japan. If they want to pick, you know, hey, buddy, pick on someone your own size, there you go. 
Ukraine is not it's not it's not apples and apples. It's apples and a and a and a peach, or something smaller, a plum. And I'm not saying Ukraine is weak. It's just geographically and population wise, it's one third the size. One third the size, and they and they gave up a lot of their defensive weapons when they left the uh, Soviet Empire. So they, the Russians have a lot of riding on this. They're going to trash the Ukraine. They're going to trash the president. They're going to say the Ukrainians are, are, are abusing the native Russian population. They're going to say that in the you know eastern part. They're going in to protect it. And then the Russians have operatives in the Ukraine, and they're going to probably do something that, you know, maybe burn a town in a Russian-controlled region, region and... They're going to blame it on Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian forces, and that will instigate uh, Russians entering into the fray. It's the way they do things, and right now they're doing the cyber attacks and all that stuff. Right now, so I feel I felt obligated to say something because of the overwhelming, overwhelming preponderance of Russian pop, uh, propaganda on all social media aspects. Stuff like that. So stay strong, Ukraine. Uh, you know, um, you know they may. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. It's a. It's good. It could be a big mess over there. People think they can contain things and can say, "Hey, listen, we'll go over there to be a walk in the park." But you know, if things get hairy, wars have a tendency to spread. I'm sure the U.S. did not intend. To stay in Afghanistan for 20 years. That was not the plan. I'm sure that wasn't the plan they presented. They said, listen, when they talked to Bush, they didn't say, hey, listen, we're going to go and take out the Taliban. We're going to try to find bin Laden, blah, 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 blah. They didn't, they didn't think and say, hey, listen, we're going to go in there. We're going to stay for 20 years and then we're going to have a messy withdrawal. No. So usually... All the military plans change right after the first shot is made. So that's it. I hope it's not too, I don't think it's too controversial. Hey, Jim, this is not Keys Bartender. That's Keys Bartender Recover Everything. I'd like to thank you for listening. I uh, hope we get one million listens. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say. Have a great day. Talk to you later. Bye.